The Umpire Inspire podcast is all about the stories, all about the journeys, and all about the heart of being an umpire. I'm your host, Jason Becker. Well, hello, umpire friends. Thank you for stopping by again today to the Umpire Inspire podcast. Something very different for you all today. In today's episode of the show, I am not visiting with a major league or minor league umpire or a college umpire or a little league umpire or high school or youth travel ball. In fact, this gentleman has never umpired a game in his life. Okay, hear me out, hear me out. Before you leave, hear me out. Because today's guest has a perspective that I am betting is unlike anyone else listening to this podcast. And I think you're going to enjoy hearing from him. Bill Nowlin is a prolific baseball author from the Boston area, and you'll hear a lot more of his bio at the start of our conversation. A few months back, I stumbled on a brand new book of his entitled Working a Perfect Game, Conversations with Umpires. I thought to myself, huh, that's kind of what I like to do on this little podcast. I should probably check this out. And I did. I read it. I really enjoyed it. It was fascinating to hear directly from the over 70 Major League umpires that Bill interviewed, some of whom you have heard on this very show, in fact. But I was also fascinated by reading the perspectives of someone, Bill, who was learning about umpires and umpiring for the very first time. You know, you and I, dear listener, we're umpires. We have put in the work. We have been on the field. We understand the culture at whatever level we are at. It's our passion. It's our craft. It's in our blood. Well, Bill had none of those things in him when researching and writing his book. By his own admission, the profession was a total mystery to him, and umpires were completely anonymous. And so his impressions of who these men and women are that choose to umpire and his impressions of the lifestyle and what it takes to be a success at this job. That was so interesting to me. And I got to thinking that I ought to just see if he'd share some of his thoughts with all of us here on the show. So I got in touch with him and sure enough, he was game for a little visit, which you are about to hear. So spoiler alert, Bill came away from his research and writing of this book with a very favorable impression of umpires and umpiring in general. And that was just so nice for me to hear. It made me feel really respected and appreciated. Uh, As you know, in this job, we do not always get that affirmation as often as we might like. So I hope that maybe you'll come away with that feeling as well. Please enjoy my conversation with the author of Working a Perfect Game, Conversations with Umpires, Mr. Bill Nowler. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Very glad to be here. Let me give you a quick introduction. Uh, Bill Nellen, you're the author of dozens and dozens of baseball books, specifically Red Sox books. And your newest book, Bill, released just a few months ago, is called Working a Perfect Game, Conversations with Umpires. I am uh, holding it right here in my hand. I've read it, and I definitely enjoyed it. And uh, I thought to myself that a lot of the Umpire Inspire podcast listeners... uh, I'd also become familiar with it. So I reached out to you and and sure enough, here we are. So thank you very much for your time. I'm, I'm very uh, interested to hear what the process was like for you and what you learned about umpires and and uh, to see what the whole thing was like for you. So so thanks so much for joining me. Oddly well, enough, I have a copy too. That is strange. Hey, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, happy to be here. It was a, a whole experience that I had not anticipated. Mm-hmm. I've been on the board of... Society for American Baseball Research for about 15 years now, Sabre. But before going on the board, we hosted the annual convention here in the year 2002. Okay. And we had different panels and workshops we put together for the attendees. And I ended up, for some reason, and I don't know how, hosting one on umpires. And so I started talking to a couple of the umpires. And then it sort of just stuck in the back of my mind. And it was maybe more than maybe more than a dozen years later, it was really 2015 that this got back into my mind as something I'd like to learn more about. Maybe I'd run out of other ideas. I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, I started uh, 
you know, you go to games and even if you even if you try to force yourself to watch the umpires, somebody hits the ball and your attention is usually drawn that way. Uh, they come out of the ground. They're out there. People yell things at them sometimes, and then they go back under the ground again. That's about the yeah. long and short of what most people think about umpires, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, then I, it turns out uh, I had a working title for this book as a joke for a while. Umpires are real people, too. <laughs> and that's what I found in, in speaking to them. I, I yeah, have yeah. access. The Red Sox give me access, uh, media access to the ballpark. So I'm able to go in, and I found out where the umpire's room was. And I basically just stood outside it one night waiting for them to show up and asked ah. if I could ask a few of them to tell me their stories. I'd written a lot of biograph player biographies. Right. With Faber, five or six page long biographies. And I thought it might be interesting to write one or two about umpires. Right. So I, I and I, just talking to them, it was just I had not thought about it much like most people. And uh, I, I became very intrigued with the, the variety of experiences that different umpires have, ways they got to the major leagues, yeah. and then what happens to them. This is great. This is such a perfect perspective for listeners of this show. Because, Bill, the listeners of this show are the umpire nerds of the world, okay? We, we know these guys. We know who works on which crews. We mm -hmm. know a lot of the backstories. You know, in the book, the factual stories were um, mostly uh, things that I had read about or heard about before. But there were parts of your book, Bill, that um, were really appealing to even me, uh, um, uh, as I said, an umpire nerd. And that was just getting to know these guys. Uh, and it sounds like that was a really great part of the whole experience for you, too. Um, let, me, let me start with just a couple things, and I've got a few questions for you, Bill. So first things first, I want to make sure that people know where they can get the book. I got mine on Amazon, so better, good place to start there. That's where a lot of people get things. Uh, okay. I do too. Okay. Uh, the publisher's name is Summer Game Books, and they do have mm -hmm. their own website, and they have a couple of dozen books on baseball, different aspects of it. So that's another place. One, they have their own website, and one could look there and, okay. and see what else they have. Okay. And uh, as far as the, uh, the boilerplate of the book here, let me just read that real quick. Over the course of four years, Bill, 2015 to 2019, prolific baseball writer and editor Bill Nowlin interviewed 72 major league umpires, another two dozen call-up and AAA umpires, and four umpire supervisors. That is fantastic. And in this book, as readers will see when they check it out, um, you go through um, several chapters of in individual interviews. Um, sometimes you work uh, in a, uh, with, with the crews, so there's a lot of back and forth between yeah. the crews, sometimes even all four working yeah. a particular game that night. And those are very interesting to see the back and forth. So let's go back to you standing outside the door of the umpire's room. Is that really how things started out? And uh, how did you continue to gain access to these guys and be able to sit down with them? When I started, I had no idea it was going to be a book. It oh, was just okay. something that I was doing, collecting, uh, uh -huh. collecting stories and, and all. But I, I just got really into it, and I, I found them, for the most part, welcoming. I thought, I mean, as you mentioned, I was able to talk to 72 umpires that were willing to take time out, usually before a game. Okay. Uh, sometimes on the phone afterwards. Uh, a couple times we met elsewhere. But usually it was just before a game for a half hour or so. Uh -huh. And uh, then I'd follow up with questions, send them what I had, and ask them if I was inaccurate in some ways. But uh, only a handful declined to speak i expected it would be the other way around that maybe four or five people would talk and you know 60 or 70 of them would say no way uh -huh. you know I, I got other things to do kid or i'm not a kid <laughs> anymore, i guess but uh i still think that way sometimes <laughs> the uh it, it just it was very interesting um and some yeah. some were kind of perfunctory and then some you know we, we became friendly yeah I became an umpire nerd myself i'm very glad to hear that welcome to the community we're happy to have you <laughs> And I have to say, as, uh, as an umpire myself, I'm, I'm glad that you have discovered the welcoming uh, and uh, giving nature of umpires. That is not a surprise to me, nor to the other umpires listening. Um, I think that we all take a lot of pride as a large community in the fact that we are servants to the game, that we are um, 
there to share our knowledge. Uh, umpires, uh, in my experience, and I think maybe you've learned this now, Bill, every umpire you, you talked with, I bet, mentioned his mentor or the, the people that got him to where he right. needed to be and, and his, uh, his starting points. Um, that's a very unique relationship that umpires have. And so there's always the passing down of knowledge and the serving the next generation. Um, that, that makes me happy that you sort of got to see that side of the guys for sure. So you're sitting down mostly in the umpire rooms with the guys yeah. uh, before the game. Yeah. They're, they're gearing up. They're getting ready to go. They're playing cards, whatever they do. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about what that was like. What was, the, what was the vibe? I did learn that getting in maybe a half an hour of card playing is an, is an important aspect of preparation <laughs> yeah. for the game. So I would, uh, you know, I'd say, I got to get out of here so you could uh, finish your hand. <laughs> yeah, but uh, there were times where all four of them sat around the table at, at Fenway Park, and uh, and we we all had a conversation. They kind of kid each other back and forth, but most of them were one on one conversations. I'd just stand yeah. in in their side of the umpires' room and and converse. And then every once in a while, somebody might throw in some comment or something like right. that. But right. the thing that impressed me right away, the first thing that impressed me was the seriousness and dedication to the game. Mm -hmm. Some people would say stuff from a, from a PR standpoint about how they really cared about the integrity of the game and all that. That didn't come across to me. What came across to me was sincerity about that. And the first thing that affected me and got me really thinking was a couple of people telling me how upset they were at a call that they had made that where they it wasn't even that they made the wrong call but they were not in the optimal position to make a call. Right. And I say, I'd say, so you made the right call. They said, yeah, but I should have been a, maybe five feet further off to the side. I would have had a better angle at it. And that's, that's you know, you've got here, you've got guys that have been doing this for 10 years. Because by the time you got to the major leagues, almost everybody's put in seven or eight years. And uh, and yet there's, and they've kind of made it uh, in many regards, certainly to the top of their profession. And there's still so self-critical if they've not performed to the best of their abilities at that given time. Well, it's in the title of your book, Bill, and you know yeah. the phrase now. You've heard it many times, umpiring, the only profession where you're expected to start out <laughs> perfect and then what? And then get better. And then get better. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, so that was a little bit of a surprise to you. What are some of the other things um, that might have been surprising to you, Bill, about being an umpire in the major leagues or about the umpire lifestyle? The lifestyle is an important part of it because I hadn't really thought about it that much. Yeah. They're a group that, I mean, there's four people on a major league crew. They come and go because of vacations or illnesses or injuries. But for the most part, there's a crew for a given year and they don't fraternize with the players. They tend to stay at, deliberately at different hotels. They don't hop on player charters and ask for autographs of the players and <laughs> no things of that sort <laughs> you know they have to make their own travel arrangements they get to the next city on time they get ready for the game and they're by themselves it's a very lonely life in a way there's a, a fraternity but if you know if you've only got three other guys and then you know occasionally other guys coming and going but it's it's a small close-knit group and certainly there's personalities and some people are get along better with some crews than others, I'm sure, but it's you've got to be dedicated to what you're doing, care about your work. You're away from your family most of the time, unless you happen to live in Kansas City and get assigned to work three games there. You're not going to see your family for a good period of time. Right. And it, it just impressed me that uh, the amount of work and care and uh, that, that went into it. Uh, it. Plus, that I had no idea that it would take that long eight years apprenticeship basically on average to make it. And, and I, I, you know, I talked to a couple of people that didn't. You mentioned a few times that you learned the truth of uh, umpire school and the percentage of guys sitting yeah, in that yeah. room every year that are going to make it. Can you tell uh, what you learned from a couple of the guys you talked about there? Well, I, I, I had the pleasure of going down and visiting the Wendelstead school for three days yep. uh, Parts of two days and then a full day in between. But uh, I got to see three days of activities. And that was just really impressive to me uh, how well it was organized. You talked before about respect for those that come before you, mentorship. But I, in the, one of the classroom sessions, they showed 
slides, black and white photographs of umpires from the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. Uh -huh. And there was a test to see how many people could name. Wow. And I'm thinking to myself, who cares? Why, why would they be? So I asked one of the instructors afterwards, I said, why would you be testing umpires that are trying to get a job in 2020, say? Yeah. Uh, and uh, you're showing them pictures of people that umpired in the 1960s. And they basically said, respect for the profession, respect for those that came before you. And uh, you're not going to flunk out if you happen to get some of them wrong. But most of them did pretty well, I, I was told. Uh, they they learned about the, the people that came before, not just the Hall of Fame guys, but, you know, regular umpires. That's, that's very cool. You mentioned that the uh, how many people uh, graduate, uh, typical class, 100, uh, 180 people or so, 150 people. And they do that thing that I think many of us have lived through at one way or another, say, look to the person to your right, look to the person to your left. <laughs> You know, only one of you is ever going to make it all the way. And uh, people go to umpire school and they get other jobs. They might work at the college level. But in terms of making it all the way to the major leagues, that's uh, that's very rare. It's the best of the best of the best. People wash out for one reason or another. Uh, but uh, some of them are excellent. They just there's no openings. There's right. just so few jobs. Right. Well, one of them told me about a story about how he went to umpire school and they're going alphabetically down the list of uh, people standing up and introducing themselves. And and they get down to the W's and the guy stands up and says, oh, my name's Hunter Wendelstead. And he <laughs> goes to Harry Wendelstead school. And yep. he said, OK, he's the guy that's going to make it. Yeah. But he three people from that class actually made it. Not only he's is his last class. name Wendelstead, but he's been hanging around this school since he was nine years old. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bringing out water to guys in the field That's and right. stuff like that. Yeah. That's right. Let me ask you a couple more questions about uh, your interviews themselves and what you learned, Bill. As I said, this is just great for me to get uh, your perspective. Um, I don't want to call you an outsider, but you see what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. Someone who m may have been learning some things for the first time about umpires. Um, sitting in those rooms with those guys, what are some differences that you may have noticed between the veteran umpires and the newer or even the call-up umpires? I don't know that I could say. I am an outsider. There's no question about that. <laughs> uh, I've never umpired a game in my life, for yeah. instance. Yeah, it's never too late, Bill. I don't know. I'd, be, I'd make a wrong call or something. But, uh, yeah. Well, then you'd be an umpire, my friend. Yes, well, sure. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that I noticed a distinct difference. I always knew who the crew chief was, and I, sure. I soon learned the differences in being a crew chief and stuff. But it's not as though... One of them was lording it over the others or sending them off to perform menial tasks or something. The impression I got was that they were they all treated each other fairly respectfully, fairly mm -hmm. equally, mm -hmm. and that they were welcoming when a call-up umpire would come in to fill in for somebody that was off on vacation. That he was immediately made, you know, not put through some kind of uh, hazing ritual or something like that, but <laughs> was immediately welcomed as part of the uh, yeah. part of the group. Yeah. So I don't think that I really saw any kind of hierarchical behavior, let's, let's say, among the, the four guys that were there at any given moment. Isn't it true, though, that you learned a little bit that um, that, that has changed over the years and over the decades? What? One of the repeating um, topics that came up in several of your interviews was um, the old days with the National League and American mm -hmm. League umpires. You asked a number of guys about what it was like back then versus what it's like now. And, and I think in reading your book that um, I understood that guys acknowledge that, but yeah. uh, it is certainly a lot different. And I think you've just hit the nail on the head. The, the mutual respect and the, the team spirit um, is, is miles different now than maybe it used to be. I'm sure it was very different uh, not that long ago. Yeah. Uh, and same thing on ball clubs. I think our, these days it used to be that when a rookie would come into a baseball team, get called up, they would treat him horribly. And I don't think that's the case anymore. I, I think that they've become more welcoming yeah. as well. Um, there are a couple other uh, uh, topics that come up repeatedly. I made a couple notes because I really wanted to ask you about these yeah. things. Um, uh, the fact that you asked several guys tells me that this was something <laughs> that may have been interesting to you in your, in your travels. Uh, gear lockers. You asked a couple of guys about their, their gear lockers, their, yeah. their, uh, there are cases where they have all their, their stuff and, and some of them are decorated. Some of them have this, some of them have that. 
Tell us about what you saw there and, and what you learned from the guys. Well, I kind of knew they didn't walk into the park carrying a steamer trunk on their heads. Yeah, right. <laughs> Although, <laughs> right. I, I've been to a couple of games in other places. I did go to Cuba. And uh, there are, at one point, I saw a couple of umpires. It looked like they came out of the woods because they actually <laughs> lived near the ballpark. Yeah, right. And uh, it wow. was kind of an unusual experience. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was just asking all kinds of questions as I was kind of curious, you know, how do they decide what hotels to stay at? Right. You know, how often do they actually fail to show up? Basically never to the uh, next city, how they'll, they'll book five or six different flights. Uh, non, they don't buy non-refundable tickets. They buy refundable <laughs> tickets. Right. And they get a whole bunch of them. So they have many, many options. Interesting. Okay. Available to them. But they, and the, the trunks are shipped ahead. They don't carry the trucks, the trunks with them. They're shipped ahead and uh, they'll get to the park before the umpires do often. A different truck will bring them. They've got to have, you know, in case they rip some of their clothing or something they've got to have people in the clubhouses prepared to to do repairs i mean they have extra sets of clothing obviously but just before they can get to the next city they'll want to have their uh shirt or pants repaired from a tear that's just uh, a lot of that logistical stuff kind of interested me yeah kind of minutiae and uh many of them i noticed right away have the the when they open the trunk the inside of the cover of the trunk will have a dozen photographs of basically family members or every, every once in a while a mentor, uh, a, an umpire that had worked uh, to inspire them someplace along the way, but usually family members. And sure. So we, I asked a little bit about that too. And this speaks again to the umpire lifestyle and what their job entails. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy. I'm, I'm looking at the introduction to your book, the very first sentence you write, Bill, working as a major league umpire is a tough job. Hmm. And uh, then a, an entire paragraph about all the things that are challenging about being a major league umpire. Um, but then, of course, there are just so many benefits. And um, and then uh, moving down through your introduction, you even say, Bill, for the right person, it's a good job, even something of a calling. Can you yes. explain kind of what you meant by that and, 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 and who helped you understand that, yeah, this is more than just my nine to five. This is a real calling for me. Well, we talked about that a little before, talking about that respect for the integrity of the game. That yeah. is ingrained in you. I don't think you can make your evaluations if you don't have respect for the game. I think, think that would get picked up by anybody watching you if you weren't moving quickly enough, getting to the right place, sure. showing care for uh, how the game is played and yeah. and all. And I think that you know, to put in all those years, it's a good job if you make it to the major leagues. You get your vacation time. You get uh, paid pretty well, uh, and you have significant vacation time over the over the winter as well. Uh, but to get there, you have to work for very little money under very Spartan conditions. Yes. Uh, not even Motel Six. It's like Motel Four sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the uh, conditions are, are pretty basic, uh, and you know you work your way up, and it gets a little better as you go. But even at the higher levels, it's the, the difference between AAA and the, and the major leagues is very, very significant. Sure is. And I mentioned vacations. I mean, they do get, you know, at least a couple of weeks off each, uh, each summer uh, at the major league level. But if you're a AAA umpire trying to work your way up, you don't necessarily. I was talking to one guy and I realized that looking at his schedule, retrospectively looking at his schedule, he had worked 159 games in the majors. He was called up and called up and called up. In the 162 game schedule, right. he basically never got a day off. Boy, they, I said, they work you, don't they? And he said, we're lucky. We're happy to get the work. That's right. Uh, because they get paid major league scale for the games they work in the majors. So they're getting paid multiple times what they would be making work in a minor league game. And they're on the right track. We're, we're on this track of what umpires think and what their uh, motivation is for this whole thing. There was one interview in particular in your book, Bill, that really stood out to me. Um, and I also want to tell you that as, a, as, as somebody who doesn't know a, a thing about umpires, I think this is a great book to read. It's the hmm. nuts and bolts of what it's really like and what these guys are thinking. Um, and for an umpire like me... Um, even an amateur or somebody who's interested in it, who knows a thing or two, it's still very interesting because we get to know the guys. 
and get to know what's going on in their heads, the heart and soul of what they're doing. And uh, your interview with Tim Timmons was really interesting to me. I really enjoyed it. And there's a specific part in the chapter, Bill, you're having a conversation um, about the desire for umpires to go unnoticed. Yeah. Um, the, the excitement, Tim says, he uses the word excitement <laughs> of walking off the field after a game and no one even knowing he was there and all the umpires that are listening are nodding their heads. Yes, that's, that's a good outcome. That's a good day at the office. And Tim says this, he says, quote, that's a really good feeling. You don't want to be a part of the game. You want to protect the game. Mm-hmm. And he mentions that again later in your conversation in the context of the relationship between Major League Baseball and the umpires union. Okay. Protect the game. Protect the game. That's an interesting phrase. What do you think that means for a Major League umpire? What did you learn about that concept of guys wanting to protect the game? Well, I think it's kind of what we're we're using the word integrity before. I, I, I mean, there are so many things that could go wrong or could be done wrong, uh, that um, umpires do not want to be noticed. Uh, as you started off with the quote, <laughs> right. if, if they can retain their anonymity, all the better. We used to have a couple umpires uh, that enjoyed being showmen years ago, and that was kind of fun in some ways. But increasingly, that's not the case. Uh, I think that that's uh, right. they just want to get on, do their job and get off. And uh, it you could be intruding on the game if you're making it more about yourself or putting yourself out there. And so I, I uh, talked to one guy who said he enjoys a little bit of banter with the fans in between innings sometimes, but it was not something that was encouraged. Yeah. In fact, it tends to be a little discouraged. But I, I thought it was good that he was wanting to humanize uh, the, that – Umpires are people. <laughs> right. Too. But, you know, I talked to a couple of umpires and other umpires and they said, well, it gets kind of it's kind of discouraged to to chat with fans too much. And, and this, so there's a fine line there. And I guess he was a little more <laughs> open about it than some. Right. But then there was another story. I can't remember who it was right now, uh, since you read the book more recently than I have. You may remember <laughs> of an umpire that walked into the park and got in a conversation with somebody else as they were walking into the park. And, you know, the guy said, where are you coming from? He said, oh, I'm from out of town. And uh, what are you here for? I just, I'm here to see the game, said the umpire to the other guy. Didn't, and uh, so they just chatted a little bit and parted company. And the, the other guy, the guy that was a paying customer said, I've got, I've got really good seats. And he <laughs> said, well, enjoy the game. And so then, you know, about the second inning or so, he, the umpire spotted the guy in his very good seat. Right. And the guy spotted him and realized that was the umpire he was talking to. Yes. And he said, that was you. That was you. And, then, and, and he, I thought he, he should have come back and said, yeah, I got a really good view myself. I'm working the fight. <laughs> it's definitely one of the appeals of uh, being an umpire, the best seat in the house. Right, right. As we like to say. Near the end, I started asking people if they had a favorite place position they like to work at. Yep. Most of them said home plate. Right. Because that's how you make it as an umpire that's where you really shine or don't but if you're in the majors you shine yes uh and uh but some, some of them had some good answers one of them said third base because it's the day after working the plate yeah. and the rotation and therefore it's a little you can get a little bit of a breather and, that, and a couple of them said second base because there's more you get to roam around more you know home plate you got to stay behind home plate you can't go wandering down the first baseline when a pitch is thrown uh, but second base, you get to play depending on how, who's on base and and uh, whether it's left-handed batter, right-handed batter, and you know you want, don't want to black the batter's view. So you, you, it's a lot more motion. My response there was, you know, I I think working the let down the left field line or the right field line is a good spot to work because that means you're working a postseason. Game. There you go. <laughs> That's good for everybody. Yeah, I don't think anybody would decline that that job. Right. Let me uh, a few more questions here, Bill. Sure. Um, for whatever reasons, who are some of the favorable standouts to you personally? Who did you really enjoy spending time with? And and what was it about those guys that may have caught your attention? Um, two guys come to mind right away. Uh -huh. uh, and there were two of the guys I talked to earlier on, Ted Barrett and Chris Guccione, uh -huh. two of the first guys I spoke to. And they have completely different stories uh, and personalities. Uh, they were on different crews at the time. 
uh, I think I can't remember who I spoke to first, but uh, Chris Cuccioni impressed me. He is from Colorado. My sister lives in Colorado. My mother was born there. And so there was a little connection that way. But uh, he put in more games working as a co-op umpire than anybody ever has. I don't remember the number now, but it was like 1,200 games. My goodness. That he worked, I mean, like 10 full seasons, practically. I mean, yeah. except he was working these 130, 140 game right. seasons. But before there was an opening, he just stuck with it the entire time, yeah. stuck with it. He was just, just open and very friendly. Uh, I was, we talked about the umpire trunks before, and I said, boy, I wish I'd taken a picture. And he said, I'll take one for you. And so he took a picture and emailed it to me. And oh, very good. One of the books. Very good. So he became a contributor that way. <laughs> That's right. Ed, Ed Barrett impressed me just because of the kind of the background he had. It came out in our conversation that he is a minister, an ordained minister, that he has a he has a doctorate in theology. And I have a doctorate in political science, which okay. has not been that evident in this conversation so far, but <laughs> something I did once upon a time. Yeah. So he's he said, Yeah, they call me Reverend Dr. Crew Chief Barrett. And I said, well, that's kind of a long handle. <laughs> they just call you Ted. And uh, he earned every prefix, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's uh, he got it all covered. But Ted Barrett comes up more than any other major league umpire in my podcast, Bill, ah. because so many of the people that I talk with have had the opportunity to run across Ted either through their own minor league journey or mm -hmm. at camps or clinics or hearing him speak. And uh, as as you learned. Um, a really selfless, uh, others-focused guy who yeah. is is very passionate about um, the way that he chooses to to uh, comport himself on the field and with the people around him. Um, quality guy, quality umpire. So I'm not surprised at all that he's one yeah, of the people yeah. that stood out to you. And and both of them were very helpful. Some people would just talk to me for 10 or 15 minutes and yeah. uh, give me what I wanted, and that was fine. But they've kept in touch over time. I wouldn't say reaching out to me, but I feel free to reach out to them. Oh, that's great. And I always get a response back again. And that's nice. Yeah, isn't that nice? Who are a few of the umpires that you ran across, Bill, that may have been, um, shall I say, outliers? Can you think of any that seem to have, um, to break the mold of, of what you expected a major league umpire to be? Was there anybody in those clubhouses that surprised you in that way? Angel Hernandez was, is kind of an interesting guy. He gets a lot of bad media attention. I think, I don't know why exactly, but he gets a lot of criticism as somebody that doesn't really, I, I don't know, I, I can't articulate it because it's somebody else saying it, not me. But I found him to be a really uh, interesting guy to talk to. His father was very, very active in Little League in Florida growing up and uh had him and his brother both very active all along. He has a somewhat interesting perspective in that he knows this is a job and he he distinguishes between his work and the rest of his life in mm. ways that maybe some other people don't. But I, I've never seen that play out on the field. Mm. I just found him, I've talked to him on seven or eight different occasions and I uh, always found him a little interesting to talk to. That came through in your book because I remember noting that to myself too, Bill when I was reading some of the back and forth between you and, and Angel in, the, in those chapters, um, some, some perspectives that I hadn't heard from him. Uh, hmm. So that was, uh, that was really good to see. It's funny, you mentioned Tim Timmons. My interview with him, I, I mentioned it in the book, I don't know if you recall, but the main interview I did with him was when he was on the phone walking yes. from his hotel right. room to the replay operations <laughs> center in New York. Yeah. And here we're talking about a guy, you know, here he's walking along the street, and anonymous. Right. Nobody knew this was some major league umpire talking on his cell phone doing an interview that was going to end up in a book. The uh, There were a couple of umpires in the old days that used to ride the subway in Boston uh, to the ballpark uh -huh. They're from the hotel. Now they have a, a car that takes them. Usually they you usually stay at the same hotel and they usually all come in the same car. Sometimes for one reason or another, maybe somebody's a Hyatt guy and somebody's a Marriott guy or something. <laughs> right. They stay at different <laughs> hotels to yeah. build up their frequent uh, stay credits right exactly uh, but but uh occasionally there there were guys that again you you watch them walk into the ballpark uh, sometimes I, I i joe west is the only umpire that ever gets noticed by fans sure walking in i i mean they they'd be walking down a ramp 
with fans to the left and right, and fans have no idea who they are, that those are umpires that are going to be out on the field. Later, they might even know their names, just haven't heard them. I'd argue it, maybe Jerry Davis, too. Maybe. Joe, for sure. He was uh, he was one of the last guys I spoke to, incredibly friendly. He was there. Uh, he His wife was visiting, and uh, so I actually ended up talking to the two of them for a while. And it was she was interesting, too, because she talked about how she thought replay might ruin some of the fan experience. Hmm. It, it has to some extent. Now, if you know, you don't have, get the great arguments that you used to get yeah, for better or for worse, but it was always entertaining from a fan <laughs> standpoint. And she said that she said, I enjoyed yeah. watching that myself. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let's wrap up here, Bill, a couple, a couple final questions for you. Just want to get your impressions. What an interesting journey you yourself went on for those four years. And, and I'm so glad you did. I really enjoyed your book. And what about your impression of umpires, Bill? How has your impression of umpires changed now from before you started this project, before you even thought of this project way back in 2002? How has your impression changed from back then to now having spent some time with these guys? Well, I'm not a young guy anymore. Uh, and here, I'm 75 as we speak. Okay. Uh, this is something that I began to learn when I was 70 years old, apparently, <laughs> five years ago. Yeah. I, it was, it was a, a revelatory experience talking to these guys. You know, I've seen umpires all my lives. I've been going to games since I was a little kid. I sure. old enough I saw Ted Williams play in 1957 and oh, 58, cool. 59, uh, and so forth. So I, I, I go to an awful lot of games. I always did as a little kid. And uh now as an older, somewhat older person. <laughs> and yet here's this whole group of people that are part of the game. But just, you know, here are guys that are involved with the game. They are a part of the game. They're an integral part of the game. You can't have a game until they start it. Right. And, uh, and uh, they, they govern the game. They keep it on track. And then to find them as real human beings that you can talk to, you can share experiences with, you know, oh, I remember that game or, you know, whatever. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm finally old enough that I've had enough life experiences myself that I, I guess I felt comfortable talking to, to more people. It was, it was just, it was very reassuring to me that these are guys that are real guys, they're family guys, they care about um, the game and, uh, and doing their job well. That is great to hear. And you found that, uh, as a rule, it's a very generous group of people. And uh, they were very generous with their time with you. And, and Bill, uh, you've been very generous with me today. And so I thank you very much. Well, we, could, we could talk for another four or five hours on. on yeah, but, <laughs> but you would just want to talk about the Red Sox. And I, I, that's a different podcast for a different day. So oh, let's do it. Sure. <laughs> we'll see about that. Thank you for your interest, Jason. I really have enjoyed talking to you. Uh, you you uh, clearly read the book. <laughs> you, you talked to some people. I loved it. I loved read it. the book beforehand, yeah. but uh, I I, uh, I value your uh, your reading of the book and the questions you asked. The, oh. the publisher, I was glad they took a chance on me. It's the first time I've done a book with them. Oh, is that right? Uh, they're called Summer Game Books. Yeah. And I think their website is summergamebooks.com. Okay. Uh, but you can just do a web search on Summer Game Books. They do have a bunch of other books. They've got a, a nice variety of books on uh, on baseball. Okay. A young publisher. Very good. Well, thanks again, Bill. This has been great. All the best with the book. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll we'll check back in with you soon. Very good. Thanks. Okay, there you go. I hope you enjoyed visiting with Bill in today's show as much as I did. And if nothing else, let's all agree that all of us, no matter at what level, we have one more fan out there. As you know, this show is all about inspiring and celebrating umpires and the job that we love. And so it was very suitable to bring Bill on to share his unique experience. And it was an honor to visit with him. You can find Bill Nowland's book, Working a Perfect Game, Conversations with Umpires at Amazon.com. Or if you prefer, directly from the publisher at SummerGameBooks.com. It's an inexpensive paperback. Check it out. I think you'll enjoy it, just like I did. Well, thanks as always for listening. A big thank you to those of you who have recently taken the time to leave ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts. 
I appreciate every one of those reviews so much. And they really do help other umpires find this show and get the opportunity to hear from our great guests. Have a great week. Please continue to share the show on Facebook with your umpire friends who you think might enjoy listening. And I will see you next week on the Umpire Inspire podcast. Podcast.